Hello magpies, and welcome back to this series wherein I give overviews of the diverse and varied kingdoms and nation states of the Forgotten Realms, as well as all of the necessary information to make a character aligned with such realms using the optional rules of my D&D world. There are grand narratives that shape the world, and then there are those places no less significant to their inhabitants and no less colourful in their unique cultures and histories. These are the kingdoms that fall politically, geographically, or circumstantially outside of the Cormirian Empire, ruled by no Palatinate, and yet they add essential flavour to the cultural mix of Faerun. It is the official position of powerful nations to come to the aid of these lower kingdoms, but alliances are but dust and air until they are tested and found firm. These are those kingdoms the chroniclers all too frequently forget. Off the coast of Tethia lies a scattered trail of nearly a thousand individual islands. Like a grand constellation spread across the Sea of Swords. The few hundred islands that may support life are largely settled by pirates. Who use these neutral bastions and hideaways to prey upon shipping lanes. Some of these pirate enclaves have become wealthy beyond, we beyond measure, sporting sophisticated gunpowder technology and vast shipyards to produce overwhelming firepower to rule the open seas. Though as of late these buccaneers have encountered something far more deadly than the muzzle spit of carronades. Giant sea serpents. Of such a scale to sink even a ship of the line. Called up from ocean depths by dro magic to patrol the seas and to transport elvish spies far and wide. Inhabitants of the Nlantha Isles speak Chondathan as their common tongue and may choose an equipment package based on their prestige on board a ship or on land. Deckhands, boarding crew and landlubbers take a scimitar and a dagger. Wealthy robber barons and those vital to the running of the ship may take a gunpowder pistol, powder horn and ten bullets, while merchants, those for whom fortune has so recently shone, and runaway thieves, may take three potions of healing and 150 gold. The major faiths of the Nalantha Isles are Beshaba, Syric, Talos, Tempus, and Umbali. The historical analogues of the Nalantha Isles are pretty straightforward. Here you may find the pirate kingdoms of the Caribbean during the Great Age of Sail, who grew rich preying upon the treasure ships that transport goods up and down the Sword Coast as well as exotic goods extracted from the distant lands of Mazdaka. North of Nalantha and west of the Sword Coast, one may find the cold, stormy homeland of the Aluskans, the Viking people who came across the sea on longships to settle throughout the western heartlands, ancestors of the Uthgart tribes of the savage north. The Moonshays are also home to the Druidic people known as Folk, who inhabit the southern islands, while the Aluskans are known as Northlanders. 
Today, the two people have become so intermingled that they are almost inseparable except by geography and culture. The Isles are also ruled by a single queen who is locally advised by shamans in the north and druids in the south. Inhabitants of the Moonshay Isles speak Iluscan as their native tongue and may choose to take either studded leather armor or a weapon that reflects either northern or southern approaches to warfare. In the south, the all folk train with bows, and thus they may take a longbow and arrows, while in the north, axes are the order of the day, and they may take either a hand axe, a battle axe, or a great axe. The major faiths of the Moonshay Isles are Chontia in the south, whom they know as the Earth Mother, and Tempus in the north. The Moonshay Isles reflect the British Isles, mixing two major themes in British history. The folk are analogous for the Druidic, the Druidic cultures of the Britons before Roman occupation, while the Northlanders represent the Norse cultures of the Viking Age. While their unification under a single queen speaks to an Arthurian mythology, gender swapped for good measure. Beyond the Nalantha Isles and nearer to the Chiltern Peninsula is a land that is part island and part mechanical fortress that is homeland to the rock gnomes and copper skinned humans called Lantana. This land is known as Lantern, and therein Gond is worshipped above all others. Though Lantanese goods and technologies are desired all over Toril, few outsiders will ever get to see the wonders of Lantern. But those who have the privilege to do so will speak wide-eyed of a land of limitless imagination. Though Lantern was devastated by a tidal wave three quarters of a century ago, it remains a land of legend and a fairy story told to gnomish children of a promised land across the sea. Inhabitants of Lantern speak Lantana as their common tongue and they prefer to fight with ranged weapons. They may choose a gunpowder pistol and with powder horn and bullets for those who like it up close and loud. Or they may take a heavy crossbow and bolts for the utility of being far away and striking silently. As far as religions go, Gond is worshipped almost exclusively in Lantern. If Lantern has an historical analogue, its strange technology and mythical status makes it more like Atlantis than anything else. Which, when you think about it, I guess that makes gnomes Atlanteans? Across the other side of Faerun, wedged between hostile forces on all sides, the mythic, mostly barren land of Rashomon is home to the Rashomar, a fiercely independent people who seek to master physical and magical perfection. They live in oases overseen by an elite sisterhood of magic users known as Hathrans. And collectively the Rashomar are famed for their warriors martial prowess 
and for being among the few human civilizations to consistently keep good relations with the Fey courts. In times past, many Rashima were taken from their homelands as curiosities, paraded around the world to be shown off in courts, or captured to be slaves in old Thay. Today, these former slaves and far travelers now return home, bringing with them the magical secrets of the Red Wizards, strengthening the Rashamar resolve to resist invaders. Inhabitants of Rashaman speak Rashami as their common tongue, and they may take equipment based on their walk in life. Hunters, scouts, and those seeking to merely outrun an enemy may take two potions of jump, two potions of healing, and two potions of vision, which uh, give plus 10 to sight-based perception rolls for an hour. While those who weave magic may take either a wand of light or a wand of detect magic, while finally those who fight against invaders may take one of the unique exotic weapons of the Rashomar. Either a spiked chain, which counts as a flail, or a nunchaku, which counts as a mace with the light and finesse rules, or a siangham, which counts as a whip that deals piercing damage. The major faiths of Rashomon are Chontia, whom they know as Bala, Mistra, whom they know as the Hidden One, Mialiki, who they call Kaliara, and finally Kosuth. Rashomon is a strange mix of cultural analogues, united by the desire to live in peace with nature, and to resist invaders. It has echoes of neo-pagan imaginings of witch covens and fey creatures living in harmony. Its warriors evoke Shaolin monks, and its Hathran rulers imply Native American shamanism. All beneath the satisfying ideal of African nations fighting back against slavers and colonists, turning the weapons of their oppressors to the defense of their homeland. The easternmost part of Faerun is a vast steppes plain astride the Golden Way to Karatur. It is known as the Endless Wastes or the Horde Lands. But to the nomadic Tweegan horsemen who call it home, it is Tarn. And the Tarn Gen is their society. A diverse spread of varied tribal culture who periodically unite when a leader rises with the strength and the charisma to unite the Tangan under a single banner. Then it shall descend as an endless army upon Faerun once more, as it did once before during the time of the former Emperor's father. Inhabitants of the Horde lands speak Tuigan, and those who fight on foot are keen archers, and they may take a short bow and arrows. But a horse is the true sign of a Tuigan warrior, and those with status may take a war horse with saddle and studded leather barding. The major faiths of the Horde lands are Grumba, whom they know as Etugan, and Akadi whom they call Talus. They also worship aspects of Eldath, Malar, and Selune, besides local spirits. The Horde Lands presents a strong analogue for the Eastern Steppes, 
And the Tangen could represent either the Huns, the Mongols, the Timurids, or even the Germanic tribes. Indeed, they fit the narrative role of any nomadic folk whose, wars, whose war path causes those who live in cities to cower behind stone walls. Personally, I like to paint them as Mongolians, because that suggests a vast network of trading outposts and a decentralized empire that stretches far beyond the borders of the map. Rather than mere fantasy tropes of simple barbarians. South of the Empire lies a vast tract of unsettled land known as the Shah. Once among the most fertile lands, vast swathes of the Shah now turn to desert following changes to the climate in the wake of the Divine Spell Plague. It remains home to an exotic array of wild animals, races of people not seen elsewhere, and deep tribal roots. Though the Mulhorandi Empire expands into the Eastern Shah, pockets of traditional societies hold out. Of Wemeks, of Thrykreen, of Centaurs, of Loxodon, of Leonin, and fearsome dire horses that are venerated by cult worship. As well as, of course, the Sharans, the humans who have lived there since ancient times, following the migration of beasts. Inhabitants of the Shah speak Sharan as their common tongue, and they may take studded leather armor and a potion of vision, which gives a plus 10 to sight based perception checks for an hour, if indeed they come from a tribe, a people who hunt close to home. But among those who must make greater journeys in search of food, they may take a war horse, a saddle, and studded leather barding. The major faiths of the Shah are Nobanyan, Mask, Ogma, and Tempus. The Shah is an analogue for Sub-Saharan Africa and Native American cultures, all neatly tied up into one. In light of the particular Shah and wildlife, I think that the African analogue is salient. Though, given the sheer size of the land, there is room enough for this description to have barely scratched the surface of this ancient land and indeed what secrets it still holds. Beyond the untamed wilderness of the Shah, hidden behind forest and mountain, around a secret bay, lies the fabled land of the Hin, Luren, which is almost exclusively populated by halflings. This is where the strong heart halfling subrace may be found, who escape the corruption of their lightfoot brethren and who live in peace still. Driven by wanderlust, Many strong hearts leave their home and travel halfway around the world looking for adventure and spreading the word of mythical Luren. Inhabitants of Luren speak both Halfling and Sharan as their common tongues, and they may take one of three equipment packages. Those who value skill at arms may take a short sword or those sworn to defend their homeland may take a dark wood shield, which is a wooden shield that weighs half as much. While those who are trained in moving quietly may take a potion of pass without trace. The major faiths of Luren are Brandabaris, Timora, and Yondala. 
Luren is analogous to various mythologies of lands forgotten, uh, mythical depictions of lands of milk and honey, and of a promised home half remembered in childhood tales. It is one part Jerusalem and one part the land of cocaine from the Grimm's fairy tales, where beggars become kings and sweet things grow upon every tree. In reality, it can't possibly live up to these high expectations, but if left deliberately vague by those strong hearts who sing its praises, Luren can be all things to all halflings. At the base of the Chiltern Peninsula lies a miracle of cross-cultural trade. The jungle nation of Tashalar is regarded across Faerun as the southernmost reach of civilization. Their Mesoamerican stone capital of Tashlutar was built by Yuan Ti long ago, by human slaves who rebelled to reclaim the fruits of their labor. And today it is one of the most important cultural uh, coastal trading cities of the world beside Waterdeep. A visitor to Tashlutar can expect to encounter mighty dinosaurs used as beasts of burden. Exotic races abound, and the finest wine in all of Faerun. The Tashalarans distrust magic users, despite their obsession with using divination magic to learn the future. Psionic powers are also more commonly found in Tashalar than in anywhere else in Faerun. Inhabitants of Tashalar speak Tashalan as their common tongue, and those involved in clandestine arts may take a hand crossbow and two doses of green blood oil, which is an ingested poison with a DC 10 constitution save to avoid being poisoned for 1d6 minutes. Or, among those who merely want some self-defense in the jungles, they may take a light crossbow and bolts. While finally, tribal warriors and those with formal military training may take a hide armor, possibly made from dinosaur hide, and a dark wood shield, which is a wooden shield that weighs half as much. The major faiths of Tashalar are Chontia, Malar, Savras, and Joaquin. My inspiration for fleshing out Tashalar is one I suspect was the intended vision by the authors. Being the Aztec capital city of Tenochtitlan, though with marginally less human sacrifice. Tashalar and Tashluta in particular is like an alternate history where the Aztec slaves overthrew their masters and became wealthy and independent by trading with Europe. Finally, bordering the central, northern and western Palatinates, we find the hellish frozen desert that grows larger every year and will one day swallow the entire world. This is the heritage of the great Netherese Empire, who, like Icarus, flew too, uh, flew too close to the sun. Their greatest spellcasters discovered magic to become gods, and thus caused the first spell plague which destroyed arcane magic and caused their own flying cities to fall out of the sky. The world was saved only by the rebirth of the goddess Mistra to heal the spellweave. Now, where ancient Netheril once stood, 
A frozen, dead wasteland has grown. A timer to the doom of the entire world. Remarkably, some incredibly hardy nomadic people known as Bedin make this land of nightmares their home. They are proud, warlike, and live by a sense of honour to self and to family, moulded by the harsh climate of their home. Inhabitants of Anorak speak Midani as their common tongue and may take either a dagger and scimitar for self-defence or a mighty short bow, with the mighty rule allowing the wielder to substitute strength for dexterity if they wish, basically a reverse version of finesse. Depending on which is more likely to aid in survival. The major faiths of Anorak are Beshaba, Selune, whom they call Ilar, Talos, whom they call Kozar, Kelemvor, whom they call Nasir, and Shah, as well as the worship of various spirits associated with certain places. With the native people of this land almost literally called Bedouins, it's clearly meant to be a cold weather variant on the harshest parts of the Saudi Peninsula. Narratively though, the desert itself, born of mortal hubris and destined to one day swallow up the whole world, well, I think it's a metaphor for climate change. Thank you magpies for joining me as we shine light upon these oft forgotten corners of the aptly named Forgotten Realms. And my, how time has flown, for now we have but one more episode to bring this overview of homelands in the realms of heterodoxy to a close. As next time, we explore the non-human communities of staple fantasy races who, in a world increasingly dominated by human empires, retreat back into their own racial enclaves, and who choose to live among their own, celebrating and preserving the unique cultures of their people. From the mountain fortresses of dwarves to the armies of the Drow. I hope you will join me next time for the final installment.